Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Happy Monday. Hope you had a nice weekend. I know you're probably saying, wait a second, we're supposed to be watching an episode of Case Cracked. What's going on? Well, we had a special event in Minneapolis uh, over this past weekend, and I wanted to share the details of that with you. For anyone that's interested in true crime or particularly true crime documentaries, maybe one of the best ones that I've seen. The event was David Rudolph, the defense attorney from The Staircase, coming to speak about The Staircase. The show was actually called Inside The Staircase, and it promised to even discuss the owl theory. So uh, I took notes throughout the show. Of course, I went. I also took some pictures, and I just want to kind of share some of that information with you guys. He has a few more dates lined up. Um, I don't know if this tour was all planned at once or if he's kind of just doing it ad hoc, adding dates on. So I'm going to have a link to his website in the description box below. You might want to check that out and see if you can catch it for yourself if you're as big of a fan of The Staircase as I am. Uh, I also was considering doing this as an episode of Itchy Mysteries, but I really don't want to review the uh, actual show too much. Um, I've already reviewed The Staircase, the Netflix, well... The former HBO documentary now on Netflix that has been extended by a few episodes while it's been put on Netflix. Um, so I'll have links to that in the description box below as well if you're just if if you're unaware of what I'm talking about. But let me just tell you guys, if you don't know about the staircase and if you like documentaries in the style of making a murderer, you really should check out the staircase, one of the absolute best. So what were some of the insights that the defense attorney, David Rudolph, who personally I look at as kind of the hero or at least the main character in a significant chunk of uh, the episodes of The Staircase, what insights did he share with us? Well, you're about to find out. Um, first, he was very clear that nothing was done in particular for the documentary, that essentially the documentarians were there to watch and to record, but there wasn't any scenes where you know they were being directed, they were told, hey, we need to get another shot of you doing this or of you guys having this conversation. Um, nothing was done for the documentary. They were just primarily given access to the people, to the places, and they did have access very, very early. And uh, he was trying to address some critics uh, who might have suggested that, you know, the documentary was kind of done in in particular for uh, getting public sympathy or, you know, trying to sway the public's perception of Michael Peterson. Uh, so he was very clear about how the documentary got started. Essentially, it starts with another documentary that we've reviewed on Itchy Mysteries, which I'll have in the description box below, called Murder on a Sunday Morning. And that was another very strong documentary. It won an Academy Award. And the filmmakers, essentially what they saw there was a case where the defense did not have a lot of money. And they thought for their next project, they wanna to try to find a case where the defense has a lot of money to spend um, so they could see what the difference is between those different, different types of trials. So they reached out to David Rudolph. They heard that he handles cases like that, kind of more expensive defense cases. And he was impressed by the fact that they had won an Academy Award. Of course, he watched the movie uh, Murder on a Sunday Morning, and he said that was a major factor. He even said that he considers himself a groupie uh, of Academy Awards. He was just really impressed by that accolade. So um, that is primarily how they got started, and they did get in very early in the process. And that's why that's part of the reason why this documentary is so good. It's just they have such access to conversations that are happening way before the trial, the whole investigation phase that's going on way, way before the trial. So they were there almost right from the start. I mean, he knew he was taking the case, but really the work hadn't started on the case yet. Uh, he made a great comment at one point uh, when he was asked about, did he have uh, any say in terms of the edits? And if you guys remember a scene in particular where he is trying to work out a PowerPoint presentation uh, and he's getting a little loud with the guy that seemingly is having trouble working the computer, uh, he says, do you think I really would have let that in? that I really would have left that in if I had any type of say in terms of the edit. And he says, you know what, the PowerPoint guy moment, probably not my proudest moment. 
Um, so it was it was a little bit of of a light twist in the conversation, which happened a few times. Uh, and even in the staircase, you'll notice that there's a few moments where uh, he just kind of brings a little light to some of these really dark and you know disturbing conversations. Um, so it was nice to have that while he was in person talking to us about this as well. Now, he did say that he had specific conditions that he had to work out with the production crew. Um, the first was that anything that they were shooting in terms of his pre-trial work, all those discussions with the investigators and discussions with Michael, all that stuff was being shot as part of his workflow for his benefit. So essentially, it's almost like saying, yeah, we know that they're going to make a documentary out of this, but I need this as an attorney because I want to be able to review this footage again later and it might help me in terms of prepping for my case. So by doing that, he actually invoked the attorney-client privilege into those materials. He was essentially trying to protect those materials so that the prosecution couldn't try to um, get the dailies from what was being shot and you know get a lot of insight into how his defense was going to go. Uh, I thought that was really, really clever. On top of that, because he didn't think that that might necessarily be enough for protecting the dailies, uh, he was dealing with a production company that was out of France and literally at the end of a day's shooting, they were taking that footage and sending it over to France. And he does say that at some point the prosecution did look into trying to get the dailies. They found out they were in a different country and they would have to learn all kinds of different law to try to go after that and they just opted not to. So he thought that that was a good aspect in terms of helping to protect it even further. Um, he also told them he didn't wanna show footage publicly until the trial and the appeals were exhausted. So for critics, people that thought this is some kind of PR piece for Michael Peterson, not really, because it was always the plan right from the first day that they would never show anything of the footage until the trial was basically over and, and the appeals were all run through. He did have screening rights prior to release, and it was kind of set up with the intent that he could suggest edits. Not that he would have any control in terms of editing it, but if he saw something he wasn't happy with, he could go back to the production company and they would at least start a discussion about why is this in there? How is it serving the film? How is it serving Michael? How is it serving me? But he said he didn't ask for any edits at all. Zero. Including the PowerPoint guy, obviously, as well. So um, in terms of when Michael's first conviction comes through, uh, he talks about that as, he says it's as low of a time in his life as he remembers. And you can see this in the documentary. He's very rattled. He doesn't know if he trusts the justice system anymore. He he's basically said that he was so confident that once they found the blow poke and they could prove the blow poke was not used as a weapon because the prosecution had been aiming for that for so long in this trial, that he was pretty sure that was going to throw all the reasonable doubt they needed at the jury and that the jury was going to acquit Michael Peterson. Obviously, uh, that did not happen, and it really kind of sent David into a, a bit of a spiral, which he touched on lightly. He didn't get too intimate in terms of details there, but he was very clear that uh, he was not in a good place when that happened. And he believes that um, you're really not going to see, because the staircase, there was really no precedent for showing uh, a defense like that before. Um, and then, you know, we had Making a Murderer that came out after, but he believes because of these films and because of what the legal teams and the media is learning from having that type of exposure, he really doesn't think that you're going to see um, documentaries have what he considers inside baseball, that much inside baseball in the future. Essentially, Part of the stuff that I love most about The Staircase is that access to him and his private investigator and kind of their open thoughts while they're going through this whole story and all this, the discoveries that they're making. And he believes you're not really going to see that uh, in the future, um, which is interesting because he also did lay out a model for how to do it. But he's really he was talking about more from the production side that he, he believes even if it was an American production, that there's no way that he would have gotten these specific conditions to feel like he could have protected his client's interests and um, 
still do things the, the way that he did them here. So it's kind of strange because in one way I see him making a model that other people could potentially follow, but he's also saying he's fairly confident no one's going to try to follow that model again. Uh, he talked about a relationship that Michael actually struck up with an editor that worked on it. Now, this isn't an editor that is actually assembling all the best pieces and making the final cuts. This was what is someone that is taking the dailies, basically everything that was shot for that day, six or eight hours of footage, and then trimming it down to the most meaningful uh, maybe one or two hours. So, you know, they're literally getting footage of people drinking coffee or walking through a hallway and all that stuff isn't great. Um, so this is the initial edit, the person that just whacks out all the stuff. You know, sometimes the footage is unusable. There's a light in the shot or someone setting up a mic on someone, something like that. This is someone that just knocks out all the absolutely unusable stuff and then sends the rest in. And then there's other editors that pick it up from there and put together the final pieces for the episodes that we saw. Um, her name was Sophie, and apparently she struck up a, a bit of a pen pal relationship with Michael when he initially went into prison. Now, according to David, that relationship did not turn romantic until after Michael got released from prison. Um, so once again, there's critics of the film that are saying, oh, look, look at this relationship. And it, it was with an editor. Of course, her point of view was going to be skewed and she was going to represent him a certain way. First of all, she wasn't in a, really in a position to do that. Second of all, their relationship was, it started as a pen pal relationship after he went to jail. So literally the whole first trial had all happened. The initial appeal had happened and he was incarcerated. And that's when they started talking at a little bit of a more intimate level. And then not until he gets out, does it actually turn romantic? So David is adamant that that had no impact on the end product in terms of what the staircase is or what we saw. Uh, he said that it took 650 hours of film to create the first eight episodes, which that's just, I, I can't imagine trying to edit down 650 hours to turning it into, turn it into something cohesive and um, so tight as they did. I thought they really did. A good, um, a good job with that. Uh, he did say that Michael and Sophie's relationship ended just a few years ago. And once again, he's stressing there was no influence on the episodes at all from that. Uh, he did touch on Elizabeth Ratliff. That was the neighbor of Michael and his first wife's in Germany that died also on the stairs. Um, and he was talking about a disease that she has, uh, vom. Willow bronze disease, which is some type of bleeding disorder. And I believe he was mentioning that because he thinks that was a contributing factor in her death. She had been suffering from headaches leading right up to when she was found dead. She actually had a doctor's appointment scheduled for two days after she died. He is just adamant that there is no way that Michael Peterson is the stairway killer. And he even said, what we consider this guy a staircase killer. You know, he kills this woman 18 years before. He kills his second wife. But for some reason, his first wife survives the staircase. Uh, it was another light moment in, in, the, in the conversation, of course. Uh, and in terms of him being in that dark spot after the jury convicted Michael, um, he said that he was actually too disgusted to talk to the jurors, uh, to talk to the jurors afterwards. And it was one of... It's interesting. It's probably the strongest language that he used in the whole night of speaking about this stuff. Um, and you could just once again tell that it's touching on a very sensitive place for him where he was really hurt. And he wasn't even really interested in knowing why the jurors went the way that they did. He was so confident that they should have um, not gone in that direction. Uh, he also did go looking through the transcript. And uh, if you can remember the blood spatter expert, Deaver, uh, he says that when he looked at the court transcripts after the fact, 40% of the court transcript was specifically talking about Deaver, Deaver's qualifications, and the blood spatter evidence. Now, on top of all that, a very interesting twist happens just a few years ago when someone that was actually working on Deaver's team contacts David Rudolph and says, you know what, um, back then, obviously, I couldn't do this. I was working on the team. It had now been, I think, about 12 years later, and he decided he was going to speak up about this. He mentioned that back in 2002, when they were going through the house, that team actually did bump into the blowpoke. They did check it out. They did take a look at it, uh, and then they put it back exactly where they found it. 
Now, you guys know that that's a big deal because the blowpoke is obviously this big aspect of the court case with the prosecution and them talking about the fact that this could have been the weapon. Now we find out that their analysts actually had that item. They actually manipulated, touched that item for themselves way back in 2002. It's very possible the prosecution did not know about that when they were putting together their argument, but just another kind of screw in this really, really bizarre case. And then I don't re recall this from, uh, maybe, maybe I'm just not remembering. I mean, it's, you know, 12 episodes is a lot to keep track of, and it's been a while since I've seen it. But uh, he talked about the fact that Mike Peterson bought three blow pokes, and he did that because he was trying to demonstrate that it couldn't be used as a weapon. And uh, David Rudolph says that's probably the stupidest thing that he could have done. <laughs> uh, it was it was just bizarre. Um, I really I don't recall if that's brought up in the documentary or not. I wouldn't be surprised if if it wasn't if it was in there. Uh, and then of course he touched on the fact that his private investigator Ron uh, passed away in July of 2018, and uh, he seemed pretty sad about that. He was saying he would have loved for Ron to actually be there at these conversations so he could help add to them as well. Um, and outside of that, it just seems like he really liked him and they worked together uh, very well. He talked extremely highly of Ron's work ethic and how he was willing to do anything and put in extra hours when needed. And um, so a really interesting night for anyone that is into uh, the staircase. If you can catch one of these events, I think you should check it out. And apparently he was doing this tour around the world. I saw that in early October, he was actually in London. So, and like I said, I don't know if there's more that are coming up that are going to pop into his schedule. It wasn't publicized very highly here locally. I'm just kind of on these mailing lists for what's happening at local theaters. And I saw that it popped up in one of those. Um, there was probably, I don't know, I would guess maybe 500 people in attendance. So um, pretty good crowd, very interesting talk. And on top of all that, he had another defense attorney with him, uh, specifically just for this night, a guy that's local, a guy that works out in Minneapolis. And his name is Peter Wold. Now, I don't know if I mentioned Peter Wold's name, but that last brain scratch that I released last Friday about the Halloween party, uh, the party bus murder, uh, Joel Loveline's death. Peter Wold is actually the attorney that got Travis Stay off. So when I saw that he was there that night, I was really excited that I might hear some more information about that case. And also because the night when I went to see this was kind of the anniversary of Joel's death uh, 11 years prior. It's the Saturday night before Halloween. Uh, unfortunately, Peter Wold did not add a whole lot to the conversation. He was asked just a few general questions about kind of defense attorney stuff right at the start. Uh, he didn't mention Joel Loveline's case. He didn't mention Travis Stay. Uh, and if you remember at the end of that brain, brain scratch, Travis Stay actually went to work for Peter Wold. Um, I would have loved to have heard just, is Travis still there? Did he get his law degree? What's, you know, what's the update around that? I was hoping to get something like that for you guys, but... Uh, unfortunately, no information about that whatsoever. I did learn that he is representing an officer out here um, that shot a woman named Justine Damon. I believe I did a Johnny Vlogs about this. Uh, she had called the police because she thought someone was being assaulted in her alley. She went up to the police car and this officer shot her. She was unarmed, of course. Um, he is now, uh, there, he has charges being pressed and Peter Wold is representing him. So the only weird thing that kind of happened the whole night was at one point, Peter Wold was talking about, you know, trying to represent police officers in cases like that. And someone in the audience booed very, very loudly at him when he touched on that subject, I think in particular because of this officer that he's representing. But other than that, just, um, a really interesting night, a lot of interesting insights. And David Rudolph is just, to me, he's a very likable character. And I really like that his whole thing was that he wants to demonstrate what defense attorneys do. That was really a big part of the reason why he even agreed to this staircase. And when he was asked, you know, now in hindsight, if you had to go through this all from the start again, would you do it? 
uh, he was very clear that yes, he would specifically because of the staircase, specifically because of the conversations that it has started and the awareness that it has raised with the public. He asked everyone in the audience to have conversations about this stuff, to share it with people, to give them that insight. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this special video for you guys here today, just to kind of share some of what he did with us. So please check it out. I'll have a link to his website in the description box below. Maybe you can go see him for yourself. Oh, the owl theory. Should I tell you? Well, in essence, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but the owl theory, they talked about it towards the later episodes that were added by Netflix to the staircase. It's that an owl attacked Kathleen Peterson, and that was part of the initial thing that happened to her that started her fall, uh, or maybe even initiated the first fall at, in the staircase. Uh, he had a PowerPoint slide put together of points that actually support that that is possible. So the owl attack, even with how goofy it kind of sounds, his point of view on it was in terms of using it as an item for a defense team to give the jury something else to consider that he might actually have worked it in if he knew then what he knows now about the owl theory. I was really surprised by that. So yeah, overall an interesting night. Hope you guys enjoyed the video on it. Thank you so much. And I'll be back with a regular brain scratch searchlight on Wednesday. Hope to see you there. Oh, by the way, next week, I'm taking a week off. Got something real special I'm doing. I'm going to tell you guys about it when I get back. So no videos at all next week. And I'm also working on an episode of Itchy Mysteries. I know it's been a long time. Some of you are asking, am I going to do an Itchy Mysteries for Making a Murderer Part 2? Well, stay tuned. I think it's going to happen very, very quickly. So next week I'll be off. But this week you still have another searchlight and a brain scratch at the end of the week. I'll see you there right here on the Lord March channel.